Our penultimate speaker is Steph Gray. Steph is Managing Director of Helpful Technology. Uh, Steph is a digital strategist and pra practitioner, runs Helpful Technology, a specialist digital engagement consultancy. He was formerly Head of Digital Communications at Biz. Uh, Steph will explore why people should bother engaging with public sector organisations online and what can be done to build trust and enthusiasm for participation through radically rethinking the feedback and consultation process. Why bother? Over to Steph. Uh, uh, so if, if Mary is a, a private sector SKP, I'm, I'm more of a public sector SKP. Uh, I was a civil servant until three years ago when I escaped now. Uh, as Andy says, I, I sort of do these things for other people um, with a, a small merry band. And I, I must have been on a bit of a downer when I thought about the, the title for this talk. This must have been a particularly grim Tuesday afternoon. Um, because I'm normally quite an upbeat kind of person. But uh, uh, I, was, I was trying to think about um, you know, how government is using social media, uh, how it's engaging with people, the consultation cycle, contrasting how government does that with the kind of amazing things you see at GDS on the IT side. Um, and I ended up with this kind of rather depressing way of kicking things off. Because, I mean, ultimately, you know, we, we live in very exciting times technologically. Um, you know, in the last few years, we've seen uh, technology in general and, you know, social media, social networking in particular, make incredible collaborations possible. So this is obviously, you know, from the Arab Spring where you know, the tools of US mega corporations enable people on the street to, to form and to organize and to find each other and to investigate uh, and to you know, uh, dig deep into what's actually going on. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not just about what's going on uh, on the street in Cairo. It's, uh, it's about the fact that, you know, so I can see some twitches in the audience. I can see some. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it, what's incredible is that you know, a guy from uh, from career can you know make a silly dance uh, and accumulate a billion YouTube views in you know just just a few weeks. Uh, you know I went to a five-year-old's birthday party the other day and they can all do the dance. They can all do the song. It's incredible how how that kind of globalized culture is made possible by the spread of, of you know these video sharing services. I mean it's you know it's still amazing to me. Uh, and you know we a lot of us remember we can see a guy float up to the very edge of space uh, and you know, jump out of his little canister and, and float down and break the speed record. Uh, and eight million people simultaneously watch him as he falls down to earth uh, 800 miles an hour uh, and sets the record. And not only can we watch him, because you know, we've been able to watch things simultaneously since you know, the moon landings, but you know, we can participate in that. We can ask the technical team questions. We can really get involved in it. Uh, we can follow the press conference, we can tweet, we can do all kinds of, we can share with our friends, and that, that is new. Um, and of course, in a few years' time, we'll all look like this, you know, well, not that many years' time, I suspect. Uh, you know, uh, some of us probably will carry it off better than others. Um, but, you know, Google Glass will, will kind of revolution, we'll, we'll have augmented bodies, uh, all made possible by the incredible combination of technology uh, and, uh, and the internet. And yet, if you think about what a government uh, policy-making process, you know, a government policy document, the government consultation, uh, in 2013, in this era of incredible technology, uh, they look like this. And they still look like this. And they've looked like this for years. Uh, they are incredibly tedious. They are 100 pages long. They're PDF files on the website. Uh, and, you know, I've been responsible for my fair share in government as well. Um, and it's, uh, it's kind of depressing that this is still the best we can do, despite all the, the amazing tools and, and the kind of example that's been set out there uh, of that interplay between society and technology. So, um, to be fair, you know, this isn't the, the limit of government's use of technology in terms of getting the public involved in, in policy making and ideas. Um, but one note, uh, SurveyMonkey is not radical digital innovation. I think in a, a lot of government organizations, SurveyMonkey is seen as, you know, that it's online, guys, you know, it, it's magic. Uh, but it's, it's really not in the context of people jumping out of, uh, of, of capsules far above the atmosphere. So what we're seeing a lot of is, uh, is organizations in the public sector and elsewhere, it's not, not limited to the public sector, um, setting up, you know, social media channels uh, and pumping out the same kind of things they would have pumped out through other channels through these exciting new mediums. So, you know, I'll pick on Argyle and Butte, but this is true of many other organizations as well. Pumping out the traditional press releases, one after another. Uh, sometimes they've, they've, they've done a merry and they've automated everything. So th these aren't even uh, human beings uh, tweeting. They are actually just machines. <clears throat> 
And, and I guess, you know, that's, that's fine. It, it serves a certain purpose. This is a, a nice one from the... Uh, this is Great Britain Facebook page. I don't know if you can read this. It's a nice picture of Trifle, and it says, Trifle is a British classic. Are you a fan? With a little link. And, uh, and 6,085 people are a fan of Trifle. <laughs> uh, and 1,000 people have shared it with their friends. Susan Collins says, yes, it is a nice treat. Uh, Pro Alan Cohen says, I think I want to become a trifle. So, I mean, um, this is lovely. This is what kind of social media is sort of about. And actually, this is, this is the, the government, a government campaign, playing the game of Facebook in quite an effective way. I mean, you know, in terms of volume of numbers, this is great. And actually, you know, this is, I'm, I'm being unfair because this is what this campaign's all about. It's all about celebrating Britishness. So you, you go on this page, you'll see pictures of, of you know, hunky men in kilts, of, uh, of beef eaters, of the classic British uh, telephone boxes and cabs and all that kind of stuff. And it, you know, it's lovely, but it's not, it's not what I would think of as engagement. And I think there's too much of, of this sort of stuff going on. Um, a channel uh, feeding um, a kind of beast. And this is, uh, this is a visualization of the beast which it is feeding uh, from Bitly. So Bitly is the service that shortens links. Uh, and they've done an analysis of the half-life of a link. So how long you can expect your link to float around in social media, how many clicks you'll get in the, in the time. So those are hours going along the x-axis. So within about three hours, you've got the clicks you're going to get. Um, and it's, it's more true for some social media than others. In some social media, the, the half-life is very short indeed. Um, and you know, that, this, is, this explains, I think, in graph form, why, why we're in the pickle we are, because we're feeding this, kind of, this beast of social media with content, which is generating content for our channels. Um, now, it's not, it's not all doom and gloom, and there are some, there are some you know, attempts that have been made to try and use the technology available to harness the wisdom of crowds um, you know, in the way that, that the case studies have highlighted. So um, you know, when the new government came in, they tried this thing called the spending challenge. Uh, which sourced uh, a lot of examples and ideas for how government could save money using, uh, well, just by being more efficient, basically. Um, and they sourced thousands of ideas, uh, and a few of them were quite good, and, and some of them were absolutely rubbish, and some of them were uh, people submitting beef stew recipes uh, and all kinds of crazy things. Um, I think what was interesting about this is it didn't generate a particularly great set of, set of examples. And what it did also do was it generated a headache for the civil servants on the receiving end of this. They, did, they didn't require it, they just got a spreadsheet full of random ideas from members of the public about um, ways to save money which were often entirely impractical and then were told to kind of sort them out and see if they were possible. So um, in terms of numbers, this looks very good. I think ministers found it you know, a good vehicle. They got a lot of coverage for the launch of it. But in terms of actually changing how people, how government works and, uh, and how government saves money, it wasn't particularly effective. And I think government has moved on since. It's become a bit more focused in how it does these things, and that's certainly improved. Um, the other classic, this is the, the Mumsnet web chat. Uh, and I think you know, another good example where you know, ministers are getting out there. Uh, they're tapping into these big online communities, uh, like Mumsnet and the Student Room and others, uh, where people meet in their tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands and talk about the issues that concern them, so kind of flipping the media on its head. Um, and they go out into these spaces and they answer questions, uh, and we all know what their favourite biscuits are as a result of these interactions with, with mums uh, and with students and with others. And it's a lovely idea. I think it's, uh, it's good to see politicians getting out there, but it's still not getting to the, the hub of, not getting to the nub of how to get feedback into the policy process from the public. It's, it's politicians doing what they would always have done on breakfast TV or in the media, just in, uh, online. And it's, it's not transforming the relationship that, that's going on there. Ultimately, it's not shifting this needle, which is the key one, I think. This is a chart just from earlier this week, uh, Ipsos Mori uh, survey looking at how much trust people have and how much uh, confidence they have in the use of statistics. How much trust do you have in information provided by, uh, amongst others, politicians? Uh, nine out of 10 have, have very little or none at all. And yet we still put politicians up front and in these interactions. You know, that's the way the civil service has been designed. Civil servants are the munchkins, no offense, I used to be one, uh, behind the scenes working on all these things. And it's the, it's the ministers who are up there as the public face who take all this, but they're also playing you know, the, the ministerial, partisan, party political games as well. And I think that, that's reflected in some of the scores they get for the trustworthiness of their information, the trustworthiness of them as individuals. So I come back to, seriously, why are we bothering? If nine out of 10 people don't trust the information from politicians, uh, if we're using these channels, we're feeding the social media beast, but we're not actually really achieving anything. We're getting people to like trifle. What, you know, what are we actually accomplishing here? Um, 
And ultimately, you know, you can settle up and a little bit kind of miserable, a little bit depressed to think about, um, you know, what's the point of all of this? Um, but I think there are some reasons to be cheerful uh, and there are some signs, some pointers to a better way of engaging the public in policy making and how to improve public services. And I think um, here are some, here are some the, the green shoots, I suppose. Um, do you want to recognise this from the, the, the riots a couple of years ago? So the rioters themselves had organised in things like Twitter and Facebook and, and Blackberry Messenger to, to work out where they were going to go in London and what they were going to smash up and what they were going to steal. And, and the more stupid ones then posted pictures of it on Facebook for the police to, to go and find and uh, go and arrest them, which is, you know, smart. Um, but the flip side to it was that the same tools which were used by the writers were used perhaps to greater effect and by great, in greater numbers by the people who wanted to stand up against some of this and actually uh, clean up the mess and sort out their communities. So this is the riot cleanup campaign, uh, which was uh, started by uh, an individual chap who started a hashtag. He got, got people together. Uh, and uh, with some help from uh, the GLA, they organized themselves. They got teams working around London. Uh, and they actually did a really good job at, at sorting out what was going on um, and clearing up the mess that the riots had caused. And I think this is a bit like we've seen in, you know, uh, on a more grand revolutionary scale uh, in, in the Arab Spring, a good example of actually people coming together and using social media to do that. So there is still this, this ability for these tools to bring people together around issues they care about. And I think the interesting thing about this is it's not, you know, we, we have this, perhaps we live in a time when people have a fairly cynical view of politicians and their trustworthiness. But that doesn't mean that people, are, I think, have, have, uh, have drifted away from politics. People still care about the issues and the, politi the political issues. Um, and you see this in, you know, in the, the strength and the spread and the rapidity in which some of these um, e-petitions are growing. So um, Change.org recently had this petition. Someone set up a, a petition for Ian Duncan Smith to try living on £53 a week after he... Uh, off the cuff said in an interview that he could live on benefits uh, he'd manage. Uh, and that reached, I think it's half a million signatures so far. Um, uh, you know, and it reached that over the course of a bank holiday weekend almost pretty much. Um, so people clearly feel very strongly about the issues. They, they want to use and they do use technology to mobilize and to connect. Um, and they want to do something about it. They want, they want to uh, kind of point this crowd in a direction and they will do something. And, and this is interesting because we, you know, this has been a busy week news-wise. There's been, you know, we're discussing the economy, uh, we're discussing our relationship with the European Union, we're discussing all kinds of deep and meaningful topics. And if you look at the most read story on Tuesday on the BBC website, it was a 10-question grammar quiz, uh, which is actually really hard. I only scored 5 out of 10 on this, and I think of myself as being all right on grammar. But, um, uh, but I think what this shows is that, you know, in a world where we, there's a lot of bad news out there, there there's, you know, there's, there's crime and there's, there's big political stories going on, actually what attracts people online is a bit of light relief sometimes and the ability to do something which they can then share and talk about and engage with their friends around. Uh, and that's something which we very rarely give people in terms of uh, government policy and government services online. So let's have a think about what uh, the government policy making process is about and how some of these tools might then slot into it. So here's a very crude, simplified version of the government policy wheel uh, where you know, at the top government thinks about what's gone wrong, it tries to identify and listen to the, the problems, it then works through the, the, the cycle of assessing some possible solutions, refining a policy that will actually address them and then implementing it, delivering a solution which hopefully works, getting some feedback uh, and then the cycle continues. Uh, and at every stage in that process, you know, it's more than, it's not just putting up pictures of trifle on Facebook. And actually, we can do, we can do more interesting things with technology uh, to actually listen, to get inspiration, to test ideas with people, and to explain and refine and to get feedback at the point at which people actually consume public services. So we actually get a sense of um, uh, how it's working in the wild, get feedback from the service users, and not just do, not just spend our time at the bottom of that circle in terms of policy consultations, uh, but actually get feedback uh, more generally, more informally around the whole, the whole experience people have of dealing with public services. So uh, I'm going to give you some five thoughts about what we could do to, to perhaps achieve some of this. Uh, and one is, perhaps the most important one, I think, is to make use of social media and use of technology something which 
public servants do every day, uh, and not just the politicians. I think uh, this is where the civil service code isn't massively helpful because it has this distinction between the invisible civil servants and the very visible politicians. And actually, um, to make these technologies useful, and, uh, I think they need to become basically part of the day job. You know, it's, it's small C communication, not big C communication. And you need to kind of take the, the use of Twitter and Facebook and other things at work out of the comms teams um, who can still run corporate channels, but actually make it a tool on the desk. And that's a job for people who run the IT networks to actually recognize these are not, uh, people, will, people will connect with their friends, they will chat, but they will also do uh, potentially quite interesting things to follow journalists, to follow the media, to follow uh, stakeholders and others um, in their area of work and actually potentially um, make some really interesting connections that improve public services as a result of using these tools in the workplace. It's amazing how many public servants will use social media outside of work but never think about bringing it into work. And it's not just because it's blocked, it's because they just don't see it as a work tool. I think we need to change that. The other side to it is we need to make it, to make it something we can, we can use every day, we need to think about how it's consumed on, you know, in terms of our audiences. And actually, um, the, the, the problem with the 100-page PDF is it's, uh, it's not an easy thing to read on a train. Uh, it's not, certainly not an easy thing to interact with. You can't fill in the 50-question uh, survey monkey survey uh, in the same way on a train. Um, <clears throat> you'll see you know, trains, carriages like this, full of people on their phones. Uh, and we don't design the interactions between people and government for these kind of contexts enough. We don't think about the way in which people are actually going to be consuming these consultations and these opportunities to get involved with us. Um, so things which are about, um, about kind of acknowledging that the mode of use are really important. Uh, I think the next part of it, and again, perhaps equally important, I think, is, um, is asking people for the right things and recognizing that there are multiple audiences here. So there are there are people who will always respond to government consultations, and we need to make it easy for them. We need to make it easy for the CBI and the TUC to do their own internal consultations with their members, to play that back into the policy teams and for that to go on. Um, but we need to recognize that for some policy areas, there are much bigger potential audiences out there. There are people who use the service. There are people who are passionate about it. There are people who live on the line of the HS2 or who would be affected by, our, by renegotiating our relationship with Europe. Um, and we need to ask those people, not just for their analysis of the policy, which is what consultations are normally about, but for other things, for their stories, their experiences of, of public services or their, their experiences of, of the world and how government regulation could maybe improve that. This is a slightly um, old example of a consultation I worked on when I worked at the Department for Business, where we tried to do some of that. We tried to unpack a consultation about the regulation of store cards and credit cards. Uh, and we had you know, the, 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 the obligatory video from the minister, uh, but we actually also had uh, a plain English version, so the policy team were, were willing to have us uh, fiddle with their words and translate 100 pages into 10 pages um, to turn their policy proposals into a, a poll people could take part in if they wanted to just nip in and nip out. But the single most interesting thing, I think, about this was the stories that came out of it, and they were people like this, so people who would never normally take part in the government consultation, um, people like Ros coming in and saying, um, I was managing okay, I was helping to pay off some family debts, uh, but then there was a dramatic change and now I'm down to my last dregs. Um, you know, I realised I should have taken out a fixed rate, blah, blah, blah. Um, and this was the kind of story which, you know, in the old days, you know, uh, perhaps this would have come out in a focus group, but government doesn't do focus groups these days. Um, and these are the kind of first-hand stories which it's very hard, you know, government departments are often quite insulated from the effect of their policies. And, and one of the powerful opportunities from technology is to bring those stories out. They don't have to be written stories. They can be visual stories. This is a, a, a picture of a, the partner of somebody who's just gone back to Afghanistan uh, on active duty. And she's using a, a service on the phone called Instagram to take a picture of, uh, in this case, something that's meaningful to her. This is her state of mind. This is her, how she feels about her partner going back. She's missing him. You know, it's, it's quite a powerful thing to have around the office. You can imagine you know, a wall full of pictures of what it means to be a small business, what it means to be a teacher, what it means to be a student applying to higher education. And really, you know, in the same way that GDS walls are covered in, 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 in kind of pictures of uh, what, they, what they're doing and their users, um, the ability to kind of to do the same in, on the walls of policy teams, to visualize the impact of policy as well as making an, an analytical exercise. Uh, and I mentioned GDS, I and mean, I think the GDS approach of using user stories to guide development, there's absolutely no reason why that kind of principle couldn't be applied to the design of how the public is engaged in policy making. Uh, I think it would be a really good way to try and um, bring that out. 
Third idea is, um, is potentially to try and make policy making a bit more, a bit more transparent, and ideally radically transparent. Um, one slightly crazy idea would be for, for every policy team, not just, not just the progressive ones, but every policy team, to, to run a blog talking about what it's up to in the same way, again, that GDS and others run a blog. The Foreign Office have 100 uh, ambassadors around the world blogging about their work. And, you know, they're not leaking uh, state secrets. They are talking about the work they're doing, the people they're meeting, the issues they're facing. They're getting feedback in the comments from these people. This is uh, Matt Ball, who's the ambassador to Somalia, and his blog is incredible. You can see here, uh, the second post down has attracted over a thousand comments because his, his blog has become a, a sort of a, a way to, um, to bring together quite a diverse range of people around the world who care about Somalia. Uh, and they were missing this platform to bring it all together. <coughs> In a similar way, you know, in the context of Leveson Inquiry, DCMS uh, made their seminar series very transparent last year. They published everything about them, the agendas, the transcripts, the presentations, who attended, uh, exactly what had been written about them. They tried to make that entire process as transparent as they could in order to build trust in it um, and uh, try and get, get some useful interaction going with people who weren't taking part in the events themselves. Fourth idea, radical simplicity, and this is where uh, God, I sound like a, a GDS uh, clone. I'm, I'm certainly a big fan of a lot of what GDS is doing, and no more, uh, no more so than in terms of how they rewrite content uh, and how we rewrite policy content uh, to appeal to a wider audience. So this is uh, an answer to the search question, uh, how much is VAT? On the left is what HMRC will tell you, on the right is what GovUK will tell you. Uh, and if you're coming to this cold, you get a much, much clearer answer from GovUK. And I think the same can apply to, to lots of other policy areas too. And finally, I think the key thing is to think about um, humanity and, and, and the context in which people use technology. You know, you can, you can post up uh, all kinds of things on Facebook and Twitter, but ultimately that stuff is mixed up with uh, people's updates from their friends. Uh, and you're competing with uh, all kinds of other far more interesting things in those news feeds. So one thing the Fire Brigade do brilliantly in London is to uh, target their updates at young men. So they are asking, they're, they're talking to young men directly. They're not telling them to check their smoke alarm, they're showing them a picture of a hole in the floor and asking them what caused this fire. And then they'll come back a day later and they'll answer the question. And in the meantime, people have been trying to figure out, uh, you know, was this uh, a cigarette fire, was it something else? If you can't be human, partner with somebody who is. Uh, the student room here is a great place for, for mature students to talk about uh, what life's like at university. GovUK is a great place to put the official information about what you can get. The partnership between them can be really effective. And finally, I think one of the most dramatic examples of being human is, uh, is the Obama campaign. And the, the Obama campaign is driven by, was driven by data. And uh, what you can see down there is the, li is the subject lines of messages sent out by email from the Obama campaign um, during, that, during that election. And they're things like, hey, hey, hey again, aloha, meet me for dinner, rain check, this is important. I don't get to tell you this enough. And you can imagine, um, you know, this is tested. Uh, this is remarkable stuff to be getting from the, the Office of the President of the United States. Uh, and I imagine that some people raised eyebrows when, they, when this was proposed, but you can imagine in the context of your email inbox, getting these emails from somebody is going to get you to open them and have a look at them. And it's because you feel like you're talking to a human being, and that's not the feeling you get when you read the 100-page PDF. And uh, as always, as every good presentation should, I think I've ended on the cat picture because one of the success areas that, one of the most successful bits of content that, that number 10 have managed to produce in recent years is uh, images and stories and the experiences of Larry the cat, uh, number 10's uh, chief mouse catcher. Uh, and some of the material that, uh, you know, him and his first anniversary at number 10, him sitting on the cabinet table as he is there, um, stories about him, where he comes from, all that kind of stuff, is what gets real engagement with their content. Uh, and you could think, you know, are we just ended back up on trifle again here? Are we, you know, are we just pumping out stuff for the sake of it? Well, I think what, what the opportunity here is, is to actually show that there are people, there are, there are human beings behind this policy-making process, uh, and there is something we can do to engage with them, and that Larry may be the hook into debates about something a bit more deep and profound. So I think it's worth bothering. Thank you very much.